If you have no credit score and no money in the bank, how would you get started in 2023 or 2024? The first thing you got to do in a situation like that, you, you have to invest in yourself. So people, you, you're not going to be able to make money. You're not going to be able to improve your credit. You're not going to be able to advance financially unless you have something valuable to offer someone else. And what I mean by that is, first and foremost, you, you need to be able to offer something valuable as an employee. That's going to be your first way, the initial way to make any kind of money. So if you're starting from zero, if you got no credit, you got no money in the bank, the first thing you got to do is you got to be a valuable enough employee to someone for them to hire you and for you to start making money so that you can start improving those those other criteria those other metrics so you need to invest in yourself that if that means picking up new skills doing some sort of apprenticeship if you have the ability to obtain some sort of degree or you know, you know vocational degree of some sort you go to school for it i don't know if you're going to be able to get student loans but there are loans and grant programs for all different income levels and you know starting points so you should be able to get some level of competency if you don't already have it in order to start working for someone else and start making money and once you get that job and you start working there then you've got to look for opportunities to increase your income and advance as you as you go up in the ranks you know, whether it's at the same company with the same employer or you start out, it's a stepping stone. You start at McDonald's, right? You're flipping burgers for a couple of years. You, you're making that minimum wage or whatever they're paying these days, right? In the meantime, you're doing something else. You know, you're taking online classes. You're going on on YouTube. You're learning new skills. You got to level up every single time. And so then you don't want to stay stagnant and stay c content with whatever job you end up starting out with you got to try to advance and try to improve and so from there as you as you go up the ladder and you start making a little bit more money each time with each new job and each new side hustle that you pick up you want to start saving that money you want to start sa setting some money aside and the key thing is too is as your income is increasing you don't want to continue or you don't want to start inflating your lifestyle at the same time so you want to make sure that things are in balance so if and as you are increasing your income, you want to try to keep your lifestyle cost as close to what it was when you started out as possible. I understand, obviously, family and you find a significant other, you want to move in together, you want to do certain things and you want to take nicer vacations and you want to spend a little bit. That's all understandable. I'm not saying that you live like a hermit and you don't do anything. All you do is suck away your money. All I'm saying is that you need to keep it in proportion. If your goal is to, at some point, obtain financial independence, at some point, start investing in real estate or start you know, investing in the stock market or anything else, you got, you got to have a, a proper baseline as a foundation in order to do that. And, and the way you obtain that foundation is by not overinflating your expenses and by at the same time increasing your income and putting away those savings and, and starting your investment. How much money do I need to save for a house hack? My advice to would-be house hackers who are asking the question of how much money do I need to save in order to have enough to buy my first house hack is to save at least 10% of whatever the price point you're going after. So you right now we can anyone who's starting out can qualify for a three and a half percent down payment FHA loan. Now there are different qualification criteria, you obviously have to meet them debt to income, credit score, all those things. But assuming you meet those, right? What's the what's the minimum amount of money that you need to come to the table with in order to close? I would say you want to have at least 10% saved. That could be $10,000 if it's a really cheap $100,000 house, or it could be 60, 70, $80,000 if it's a much more expensive house in a much more expensive area. So all of that is relative and it's relative to the price. So three and a half percent of that down payment or that that amount would go toward the down payment right then you're also going to have quite a few closing costs and there are a lot of different closing costs that come up between title insurance points that a, a lender might charge prepaid fees of different kinds escrow of taxes insurance all those things add up to significant amount of money up front and that is something that you either have to come up with on your own you have that money in the bank accounts, so you would be taking that from that 10% that I'm talking about saving. Or there's a strategy where you could ask a seller to give you a seller concession or a credit toward those costs. So essentially, you'd be rolling that cost into the purchase price of the property. And also, it, gets an, it ends up getting rolled into the loan itself. So 
you you have to have some source of funds in order to cover those expenses. But for me, I would say the safest, at least the baseline minimum amount will be 10% of whatever the purchase price is going to be. And if you can save more, all the better. I prefer to have some reserves as well as covering those hard costs in the beginning uh, in, when you're first buying the property and you're closing on it. You want to also have some funds set aside that can cover things that maybe I'll unexpectedly break immediately after you buy the property. So if you spend all your, of your money that you saved on the down payment and the closing costs, and then you had $500 in your bank account and you are so happy that you got a property, here you go, you just walk into it and now it's January and your furnace breaks and it's gonna cost $3,000 to fix that furnace. And you only have $500 in your bank, that's a, that's a bad situation because now you have to go into some sort of debt, put it on a credit card, figure out another way to finance it because you don't have that money. So to me, I would say you want to have at least a few more thousand dollars in addition to the closing costs and the down payment set aside in order to cover those types of expenses and those types of unexpected occurrences. How long does it take to get a tenant for my house hack after I buy it? So the amount of time between Purchasing a house hack and finding a suitable tenant will vary, you know, significantly from case to case. I mean, I've when when I purchased my first house hack, I there were two tenants. It was a duplex. There were two tenants occupying both units, right? So, I intended to move into one of the units and I intended to rent out the other unit to a tenant. So what I said to a seller at the time when we were negotiating our deal, and I said, look, I, I saw the tenants. I went in there you know, when I did the walkthrough of the house and I really didn't like what I saw. First of all, they were not very clean. They had a ton of cats and I come to find out later that the cats had fleas on them. Then they were also paying below market rents. So all those factors to me basically were like, okay, I don't want these tenants when I buy the property. So I asked the seller and then we worked that into the deal that the tenants will be gone before we close. So they were month to month tenants. So I had the seller give them notices appropriate notices in my state the tenants vacated the property before i took ownership and then i closed on it so what i did in my case at that point is i did some light remodeling to both units so one to make my apartment livable to the condition that i would be happy living in and i also did some work to the other apartment in order to get the market rents that i knew that the apartment could get and this was a very light remodel at the time when i did my first house hack I didn't know much about construction. I didn't know much about repairs, maintenance, or any of that stuff. So I had to learn everything on the fly, and I also paid contractors to do most of the work for me. I did the painting. I did a few other you know, plumbing things, a couple of minor things that I learned along the way. But for example, I changed carpets in all of the rooms. So the carpets were really old. They were like 10 years old, really ugly, dirty. It, like I said, they had cats, animals, all that stuff. So all that had to go, carpets, pads, had that replaced. And then we did some other small little improvements, made the apartment look nice and fresh and clean. It wasn't necessarily the most up-to-date. I didn't have stainless steel appliances. I didn't splurge on that at the time, but it was good enough to get me to find my own tenant that would pay market rent and would be a good tenant in that building where they're gonna be my neighbor. So to answer the question, how long does it take? Well, if you already have a perfect situation, you have a great tenant next door and there's nothing that needs to be done and they wanna stay, and they're paying market rent, it could be immediate. So you're buying a house hack, you're moving into one vacant unit and the house comes with a tenant that is already perfect for you. That's awesome. If you can find that situation, that's great. A lot of times you won't have that situation. There'll be some things that you will need to do after you close on that property. Like I said, in my situation, my case, it was a complete overhaul where the tenants left i asked them to leave before the closing and then i turned it around and i did painting and i did remodeling it could be something less drastic than that you know so that for me that took a month or two before i got a new tenant in there in a different situation it might be just we need to increase the rent and the tenant says oh you know i don't want to pay that much okay that's fine so then they leave and then maybe you do a smaller remodel on the apartment and you re-rent re it but in my experience it's always better to screen and rent to your applicants, people that you pick for your apartment, as opposed to dealing with the original existing entrenched tenants, because a lot of times they'll actually feel like they own the property more so than you. And you're the interloper. You're coming in from the outside and you're kind of telling them, oh, this is going to be like this. And they're telling you, no, 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 we've been doing it like this. And this is how we want this 
the things done. So there's a little bit of a power struggle in that situation. And that happens all the time. And so legally, you're the owner, you're in charge. So you have to just act like it and take take charge of it. And if a tenant is going to be difficult, you, you want to move them on and then put your own tenants in there that will respect your rules that will be coming into it, knowing that you're there, you own the property, and they're new to the property as opposed to the other way around. Can I house hack and pay a property manager to manage my tenants for me? There are two things. So one, you can definitely outsource property management to a property management company when you're doing a house hack or for any rental property for that matter. But I would say it makes a lot more sense to do that with a non-owner occupied situation versus an owner occupied situation. And that is, this is all personal preference. I think that there's no right or wrong way to do this. I think that you could outsource it, but my personal feeling on it is you're kind of cheating yourself if you're doing that. Part of the benefit of doing a house hack is to learn how to be a landlord and how to manage tenants, manage difficult situations, figure out how this real estate strategy and game works. And if you're totally hands off and you're completely handing it off to someone else, then I think you're missing that part of it. And the other part of it too is, I'll be honest, most property managers are not going to do a very good job or as good of a job as you would because they don't care about that property as much as you do. So you might end up hiring someone and then you might end up being frustrated because the level of effort that they're putting into things are not the same that you would put into them. And this feeling might be even more amplified because you're actually living at this property and you're seeing things firsthand that annoy you, but because you can't walk over next door and tell your tenant, hey, knock it off, you're playing music at 11.30 at night or you're having a party over here, you're instead running to your property manager, you're texting them and asking them to call to make that phone call. And maybe that property manager is not getting back to you until the next morning. So that is a recipe for frustration and just you're simply handing off responsibility for something that you should be responsible for to someone else and then expecting the results to be the same as if you were doing it. And I just don't think that it works like that. Hey guys, tap or click the screen in the corner for the next house hacking video you should watch. And if you want to go deeper with me and ask me your questions about house hacking or being a rental property owner, join me in my free private house hack mastery group on school.com. I post exclusive content and bonuses in that group, and you can connect with me and other like-minded investors. Also, if you're just getting started and thinking about buying your first house hack, grab your free copy of my house hack success checklist. Both links are in the description below.